Greetings, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on pancreatitis. We're going to go over both acute and chronic pancreatitis here, which are two separate clinical entities. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already uh, stepped up to donate. I appreciate it very much. Okay, so this is just kind of a, uh, a, a brief review of the functions of the pancreas, which are manifold. Uh, remember that the pancreas is both an exocrine and an endocrine organ. It serves two major purposes. Uh, one is to uh, regulate sugar, and the other is to aid in digestion. And we'll see both of those come up, particularly when, particularly when we talk about chronic pancreatitis. Now, anatomically, the pancreas is kind of right in the middle of the body. It's posterior to the stomach. And when you look, as we will, uh, at an axial CT, it's fairly easy to identify the pancreas. Uh, one, you can look for the stomach. A lot of times there'll be a, a gastric bubble. Um, another way that you can do it is just look right squarely in the middle of the uh, axial CT, and you should be able to find it pretty easily. Now, acute pancreatitis is sudden inflammation of the parenchyma of the pancreas. Basically, what happens here is you ha have either an obstruction or a direct injury to the pancreas. That can be drugs, but more commonly, it's alcohol. Um, and that leads to an activation, an inappropriate activation of pancreatic enzymes. Now, as you remember, two of those enzymes are lipase and amylase. And so that's going to break down a lot of the tissue of the parenchyma and the surrounding fat. Uh, that destruction then leads to an inflammatory response. And then you get inflammatory mediators like interleukins and so forth. And that leads to the syndrome. Now, the most common causes of acute pancreatitis in the United States are alcoholism and gallstones. About 60% of cases can be attributed to that. Um, another substantial amount of cases are going to be idiopathic. Okay, uh, so these are the causes of acute pancreatitis, and idiopathic is obviously not listed, but of the cases that we can identify a cause, these tend to be them. All right, uh, so what do we see with a patient with acute pancreatitis? Well, they're typically going to have a history with some risk factors. Remember that alcoholism and gallstones are the typical causes. So uh, they may have just recently went on an alcohol binge, or they may have the uh, gallstone risk factors. Remember the four Fs, fat, female, fertile, and 40. How are they going to look? Well, the big symptom that you need to be familiar with, and pretty much all of them will have this when they come in, is severe epigastric pain that radiates straight through to the back. Okay, epigastric pain that radiates the back. You need to know this. What they can also have, and what they do typically have, is nausea and vomiting. Probably about three quarters of patients will endorse a history of nausea or vomiting. They can also have chills or fever, and that's pretty ominous. Now, the pain may be worsened by eating. Some of these patients will have a food fear. It may also be worsened by laying down. So when you go in and see these patients in their rooms, a lot of times they'll be sitting up. And that's unusual because usually when a patient is feeling good, they want to lay down and close their eyes. These patients won't be doing that because that'll worsen their pain. The findings on physical exam, epigastric tenderness, decreased bowel sounds, and then some of these cutaneous signs that you really rarely see, probably only in about 5 to 10% of patients. Those are Gray-Turner sign and Cohen sign. Now, what are you going to do? You have a patient, you're pretty sure they have pancreatitis. The first thing you need to do is resuscitate them. A lot of these patients will come in and they'll be hypotensive and volume depleted. You've got to make sure that you're replenishing their fluids and this is very important, particularly within the first 24 hours. Now, usually when you think of replenishing fluids, you think, I'm going to do a bolus of normal saline. If you're suspecting pancreatitis, what you need to go for is Ringer's lactate. That's been shown to be superior to normal saline. And of course, if you're dealing with an alcoholic, you're going to be banana bagging them. Make sure you give them thiamine 
and B vitamins in addition to their fluids. You also want to tend to the pain. Usually we go with morphine here. Give them an antiemetic and they will be NPO at least for the first 24 hours. For labs, you've got to get amylase and lipase. That's part of our diagnostic criteria. So that's the most important lab to get. You'll also be getting other routine labs. You want to get a CBC looking for inflammation, looking for the possibility of an infection, get a BMP looking for electrolyte disturbances. Liver function tests will help you identify the possibility of a, uh, of a gallstone. Same with LDH and arterial blood gases, especially if they look really sick. Another thing you might get is a serum, calcium. Imaging, we go for the CT of the abdomen. As you'll see, that's the best way to image the pancreas. This is Cohen's sign. It's a periumbilical hemorrhage. Uh, and uh, this is Gray Turner sign. It's on the flank. Our diagnostic criteria, acute onset of upper abdominal pain. Everyone's going to come in with this. This is the classic stereotypic presentation of acute pancreatitis. So pretty much everyone's got that. Then you just need to look. Amylase and lipase, if it's three times the upper limit of normal, you've nailed your diagnosis. Or if you see CT findings consistent with pancreatitis, you've nailed down your diagnosis. Now, why is that amylase and lipase so important? Well, because the CT findings may not be present until after a whole day after the pain sets in. So you may not see findings of pancreatitis when you get your CT. So that's why the amylase and lipase become important. Now, I put some images on here of pancreatitis. The one thing that I want to draw in here, okay, this here is normal, and I wish I had a different color other than black here, uh, but the pancreas should be very easily delineated and easy to, to pick out. Now, what happens is as you start to, in the very early stages of acute pancreatitis, what happens is you get some edema. Um, and so it becomes a little bit more difficult to pick out the pancreas. So you see it here. You see a little bit here. I mean, the pancreas is kind of right here, and this too. Uh, but what you see here is some fluid, and I kind of covered it up, but hopefully you can see that. Now, as it progresses, you really start to see a, uh, a, a, a lack of a clear outline. So here, these red arrows are showing some fat stranding and some fluid around the pancreas, and then uh, this particularly here with the red arrows, appears to be some necrosis of the pancreas. Okay, so those are just some more images. Now, if the patient has risk factors for gallstones, you can get a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Now, a lot of people say go for the right upper quadrant ultrasound first, but the problem is, is that it's indicated to get a CT abdomen if you don't see findings consistent with, uh, with pancreatitis on the ultrasound. And it's, well, you know, if you already have a patient with a classic presentation of pancreatitis, well, then you're going to be getting it anyway. So you might as well just get it first. Uh, but some people do recommend getting the right upper quadrant ultrasound first. You can, there are findings you can see on ultrasound that would be consistent. The problem is, if you go back here, it's not part of your diagnostic criteria. So you're probably going to need to get the CT anyway. If the cause is gallstones, then the patient should have a cholecystectomy within 48 hours, i.e. during their admission. Ranson's criteria used to be used for determining whether a patient had mild, moderate, or severe pancreatitis. Now, because the management does not really differ, we don't really use Ranson's criteria a whole lot, but I included it here um, for completion's sake. Now, you can also determine the severity based on your CT findings. Uh, your radiologist may include that in the report. That's called the Balthazar score. Just make sure that when you're sending, and this is just important for clinical practice, make sure that when you send a, a, a reading off to a radiologist that you let them know why you're sending it, i.e. the patient's got symptoms consistent with pancreatitis. So then they know what they're looking for, and ideally, so they can give you that score. Now, the treatment is supportive. So we admit them. They're going to be NPO for 24 hours, then advance the diet as tolerated. It used to be that we would advance their diet with the pain. As the pain started to get better, then we would advance their diet. 
Now we do it a little bit earlier. That's the recommendation. Anytime someone's NPO, we got to give them maintenance fluids. We're going to give them pain medications as needed. And if a gallstone etiology is identified, you will do an ERCP uh, to relieve the obstruction if there is an obstruction. If there's no obstruction, but there's gallstones in the gallbladder, uh, then you're going to get a cholecystectomy. Because what that shows is that you may have had an obstruction, but now the gallstone has passed into the uh, duodenum. And um, so the cause was a gallstone, but um, you know there's no reason to do ERCP now because there's no obstruction, but you're still going to take the gallbladder out. Prophylactic antibiotics are no longer recommended, regardless of the severity. The only time we're going to give uh, we're going to give uh, antibiotics is if they show signs of sepsis or if they show signs of uh, of the uh, severe inflammatory response syndrome. Now they are pretty much the same symptoms. So remember your SERS criteria, if they meet those criteria, then you will give antibiotics. The best one you should go for is imipenem. Okay, but we do not give antibiotics empirically regardless of the severity. It's only if they have SERS or septic symptoms. After discharge, you're going to advise them the risk factors, cut back the alcohol, ideally cease the alcohol. One of the complications is a pancreatic pseudocyst. You should be familiar with this. It'll be a dull pain, early satiety. You may be able to feel it, but most of the time it's asymptomatic. Diagnose it with CT. If it's symptomatic, you can surgically drain it. This is what it looks like. So you can see they can get pretty big. Chronic pancreatitis is basically where the pancreas stops working. So it may present with a little bit of mild, dullish pain, um, but it can get severe. So it can be confused with acute pancreatitis. What you'll see is if you get amylase and lipase, it's never going to be at that level of three times above the upper limit of normal. Uh, but what you will see is a history of malabsorptive symptoms. They may have an elevated blood glucose because they're no longer making insulin in sufficient amounts. To diagnose this, get a CT of the abdomen. And what you'll see in many cases is calcification of the pancreas. So uh, very obvious here. Sometimes you can even see it on plain film. Um, so... Uh, you can also diagnose this. This is not the best initial test. You can diagnose it with the fecal fat test. Uh, CBC may show signs of chronic alcoholism, which could be the cause. Um, also, with alcoholism, remember that you can lack B vitamins um, due to malnutrition, so that could show you signs as well. The treatment is symptomatic. Pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy modify the risk factors. So to recap, acute pancreatitis, usually caused by alcohol abuse, gallstones, symptoms, severe epigastric pain that radiates to the back. A lot of times they're throwing up, they're nauseous, they don't want to eat. Best initial test, amylase and lipase. Most accurate test, CT abdomen. Management is supportive, NPO, IV fluids, pain control, advance their diet as tolerated. Chronic pancreatitis is recurrent and persistent abdominal pain due to progressive injury. Uh, it typically results in scarring and loss of function. The symptoms are going to be these sudden attacks of mild to severe pain with a history of malabsorption, usually a chronic alcoholic. The best initial and most accurate test is the CT abdomen, which will show you calcifications in most cases. The management is symptomatic, mostly uh, replenish their pancreatic enzymes. And that is it.